Good morning. Good morning. And a welcome to worship here this morning. Um, but before we start worship, Happy New Year. And I wonder if you haven't already, you might just take a wee minute and stand up and greet the folk around you and wish them a happy new year because we're, we're just the first part of the new year. Let's do that. Shall we? A happy new year. 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 It's, it's, it's just good to remember as we come to worship that we come uh, as a family. I, this morning, we're doing something different with these tables, which I hope you'll enjoy. But at the same time, there's a little bit of a, everybody's back there. Um, so it's just good to be together. This is the first Sunday in Epiphany. We move from Christmas to Epiphany. We left Christmas story with the shepherds going out, singing the praises of what they'd seen and telling people of what they'd seen in that place, and the wise men traveling back to far places with a story of what God had done. Epiphany is a season where we come and we celebrate what has happened at Christmas, but also it being seen by the whole world that Jesus is here. So let's begin, shall we, by singing, Joy Has Dawned Upon the World. Let's pray together. Father, we come to you at the beginning of this new year. We come to you with all our hopes as we look forward and with all our fears. And we come to you in Jesus Christ. Lord, we come looking for that which we have celebrated in these last weeks to remain with us. 
for that which began to grow within us. For He who came to teach us and lead us, and we come remembering His death and His resurrection and the completeness of the story. Lord, as we come today, renew us at the beginning of this year in that which You have done for us and given to us, we pray, that we might face the future with whatever uncertainty, knowing and worshiping Him, born for us, living for us, dying for us, and rising again. And we ask this in Jesus' name as we pray the words that He taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be Your name. Your kingdom come, Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Well, folks, the tree's gone. Um, the decorations, are they packed up? Ours are in boxes in the lounge. We took them down yesterday, um, so they're just about away. But we're getting there. And the good news is it's only 300 shopping days till Christmas. But it is that season where we think about everything that's away. I've got a, 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 my nativity set that we have out at home, and it's all packed up in the box. The shepherds, the angels, wise men, the baby, the sheep, the whole lot is all packed away. And I, but I was thinking about what we've enjoyed and what we've remembered over Christmas. And I'd started off the story with showing you the selfie nativity. Can I just show you and remind you of that? We, we told the story using a modern, these are created with artificial intelligence by a minister. So I, I was about to make some joke about that's the only type of intelligence you sometimes get. But um, yeah, and they, they just brought the whole story to life. Remember, we, we, we looked at Mary and Joseph and thinking about the joy that they would have had, like many of our own families had or over the birth of a baby, or they're shepherds. I just love that picture. And the wise men coming as well with big grins on their face as they found the baby. But see, what happened next? What happens when Christmas is finished? And the guy that did the selfie nativity has sent me the selfie nativity epilogue. And I thought I'd show you that this morning. The things that happened that we find in the Bible. Eight days after Christmas, and this is just about eight days after Christmas, Mary and Joseph took their baby to the temple to dedicate him to God, just like we bring babies to be baptized, dedicating to God. And there they met two strange people, an old man in the temple called Simeon who just wanted to sing when he saw the baby Jesus, because he recognized right away that this was the one he'd waited for, and he was just delighted. And an old woman called Anna, and she was just delighted as well. She'd waited for God to send this special king, um, but she did warn Mary that it wasn't all going to be easy. Jesus would break her heart as well. And then Joseph got a warning from an angel, another angel, a warning that there was danger. Herod was going to send the soldiers to Bethlehem, and so they fled. Now, you might like to go somewhere hot at this time of year, but they had to flee their homes like many people have to flee, and they had to become asylum seekers in Egypt. And they had to stay there for quite a while in Egypt until they got the message that it was safe to go back home. And that is the selfie story. But it goes on from there, because every year, Luke tells us, Mary and Joseph went back down to Jerusalem, and they took Jesus with them. I don't know if you've got pictures from every Christmas, but they would have had pictures if they'd had a camera from every time they went to Jerusalem for that big festival. And they did that for 12 years until we come to the story of what happened in the temple when Jesus got lost, they thought. But actually, he was there because he was starting to think about God's mission. 
And of course, it doesn't stop there with that part of the selfie story because the story goes on of Jesus coming and Jesus teaching and Jesus healing and Jesus dying and Jesus rising again, the fullness of the Christmas story. But Epiphany is when we remember that this didn't just happen in the corner. It was sent out into the whole world and has shaped the whole world to today. From every part of the world today, Christians will be worshiping and telling this story from China to India to South America to Africa to every part of Europe, Australia, the whole of the world where people are knowing and celebrating this story today. In some parts of the world, it's also called Three Kings Sunday. So, I have to unpack the nativity scene and take the kings out. In fact, I had folk that were taking photographs of the three kings in lots of locations today. And I guess that's thinking about this. The kings came from far away and heard the good news and took it home with them. We don't know what happened to the kings. But do you think they just went home and carried on? Or did they go home telling people about what God had done, knowing that the world had changed forever, the one that they had come and found and worshipped, going back and forgetting star charts, but starting to read God's Word in the Scriptures where they had found out all about Bethlehem and finding out more and more of the story. The epiphany is perhaps for us also where we think, what does it mean to take the story of what Jesus has done into the places that we are with all our hopes and our fears and to look for Jesus in those places and commit ourselves to living for Him. We're going to do at the end of the service, I'm going to invite everybody to come and to light a candle. Um, but in, after we've sung the next hymn, our, our junior church are going to be going out. So I'm going to invite, as we sing this next hymn that speaks about Jesus coming into the world, that if you're a junior church leader or a junior church member, that if you want to come and to light a candle before you go out. And as we're doing that, what we're really saying is, let the light of the world be in my life and in the places I am as we move on from this Christmas period. Let me really know what it is to follow and to love the Lord Jesus who came at Christmas and gave His self for me. So, let's sing together, light of the world, you came down into darkness. And as I say, junior church, come and light a candle as we do that.
just got um, one uh, announcement to make this morning, and it's with sadness that I have to announce the death of Norma Fraser um, of Kirk, Kirk, Neth, Kirk, uh, Kirk, Kirk Nathan. Sorry about that. Um, Norma died just this last week, um, and so we remember her. She's a very faithful member here, uh, involved in the sisterhood uh, as well. And so our thoughts and prayers are with Fiona Sharkey and with all of her family at this time. I'm going to read God's Word together, reading from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 1, and reading at verse 1. Let's hear the Word of God. The beginning of the good news about Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God. It is written in Isaiah the prophet, I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way, a voice of one calling in the wilderness. Prepare the way for the Lord and make straight paths for Him. And so John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. The whole of the Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem went out to him, confessing their sins. They were baptized by him in the Jordan River. John wore clothing made of camel's hair and a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. And this was his message. After me comes one more powerful than I, the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I baptize you with water, but He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. At that time, Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. Just as Jesus was coming out of the water, He saw heaven being torn open, and the Spirit descending on Him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my Son, whom I love. With you I am well pleased. At once the Spirit sent Him out into the wilderness and he was in the wilderness forty days, being tempted by Satan, and he was with the wild animals, and the angels attended him. After John was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God. The time has come, he said. The kingdom of heaven has come near. Repent and believe the good news. As Jesus walked beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come, follow me, said Jesus, and I will send you out to fish for people. And at once they left their nets and followed him. When he'd gone a little further, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and his brother John in a boat preparing their nets. Without delay, he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed him. Amen. And thanks be to God for His Word. Let's praise Him again as we sing, Great is Your Faithfulness.
Let's pray. Father, as we come at the beginning of this new year to Your Word and to spend time reflecting on it, we pray that by Your Spirit, this just wouldn't be the normal, but You might touch us, challenge us, heal us, and encourage us this morning. Amen. 2024, gosh, you're starting to remember the date. It's difficult, isn't it? But I wonder what this year has got in store for you. I, I was just beginning to reflect on what might happen this year. Of course, we're, we're nervous about some of it. What's going to happen in Ukraine? What's going to happen in Gaza, in Israel? And then there's elections this year. There's going to be an election in India. I don't know much about that one. There's going to be an election in America. I'm a bit nervous about who's going to win that one. There's going to be an election in Russia. I think I know who might win that one. And who knows, in the UK, probably an election here too. Think about governments and big things. But it's not all about governments and big things. I was reading that NASA are planning to send men back to the moon this year. That's going to be a bit different. We haven't done that in at least 50 years. Um, so that's different. And then, of course, the banknotes in your pocket, if you've got any are going to change because we're going to find our new king's head on them. I wonder what else you're looking forward to in 2024. Scotland winning Euro 2024? Yeah, can but hope. And then I looked to see what was going to happen in the cinemas this year, what I could look forward to going to see. Gladiator 2, Inside Out 2, Kung Fu Panda 4 and Paddington 3. There's a sort of theme here, isn't there? Originality and creativity. Mm, maybe not. Lots of different things going to happen in this coming year. And what about for us? What does the road hold as we look forward? As a congregation, um, a presbytery plan, I hope, and quite possibly steps towards or perhaps the whole of a union with Cross Hill as we met with them last week. That was good. And an opportunity as we do that to, to reorganize, to rethink our congregational life together, how we do things, how we are things, how we and our mission in our community. Then, of course, there are all the questions about what this year has in store for us individually. There are some things that we're maybe excited about. There's some things that we're maybe nervous about or terrified about. And then there's all the things that we don't know. Where do we start? And where does the first sermon of the year start? And that's what I'd been toiling and thinking about all week. And I decided it could start in many places. It could have started, I suppose, as a spiritual version of New Year's resolutions. Here at the beginning of the year is an opportunity to recommit ourselves to new things we're going to do, to new ways we're going to work. Here at the beginning of the new year is a time to say, I'm going to give more. I'm going to get involved more. I'm going to encourage more. I'm going to read my Bible more. I'm going to pray more. Or here is, uh, at the beginning of the year, not just New Year's resolutions, but an opportunity to personal discipline. I don't know how many of us at the beginning of a new year are deciding we're going to take more exercise or we're going to go on a, a diet. But a time maybe to reflect spiritually. What does that mean for me as I seek to grow this year? But I don't want to start in any of those places. You have enough people telling you what you should do. I want to start somewhere else, somewhere more obvious, somewhere, in fact, every sermon should start, every part of our church life should focus on, simply on Jesus. And that's where I want to bring you today. The beginning of the Gospel of Mark starts up with these words, the beginning of the good news about Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God. Now, if you're looking for a plan to get your Bible reading going this year, and you don't have anything else, I will say to you, 
why not start by reading the Gospel of Mark, 16 chapters, do it in 16 days. But I don't want you to do that because I should be reading my Bible and I'll feel better if I do. Or I don't know my Bible very well and if I read it more, I'll learn more about it. Or because it's a good discipline for me to grow spiritually. I want to encourage you to read it so that you would find good news. So you would be remembered and remember that the gospel that we come to isn't a set of instructions or another thing to do, or another bit of guilt, but it's good news. And it's about Jesus. And He is good news. And there's nowhere better to start at the beginning of the year. Jesus the Messiah, says Mark. Now, that word doesn't mean an awful lot to us in our context, but in Mark's day, the Messiah is the one everybody was looking for. And what Jesus was, what, what Mark was saying, as he said, is the gospel about Jesus the Messiah, is he was saying to the folk, whatever it is that's on your heart right now, about the pains of the society about you, about the hopes for the future of the kingdom or the election of the Romans or whatever else it is, Jesus is the one that can fulfill that. This is what I want to bring you to. Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God, the Son of God. Don't doubt who He is. And that term, the Son of God, is spelled out in the next bit where it has God saying to His Son, you are my Son whom I love in whom I'm well pleased. That sense of the joy of the Father and the Son. Mark starts off by telling us that everything he's going to tell as he tells this story is, is good news. The, the Greek word, if you want a bit of Greek, is euangelion. It literally means the good message. And it's a technical term in Greek because the word euangelion is, is used of a royal proclamation. You know when they put something on the outside of, of the, the palace door in, 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 at Buckingham Palace, and the last proclamation we heard, of course, put there was not good news. It was the death of the late queen. But, but, but actually, when something's put up there that says, a prince has been born, or somebody's getting married, or, or, or there's really fantastic news, and a royal proclamation perhaps done that way, or with a herald blowing a trumpet, was what was done before there was the BBC coming in with an announcement that told people a battle had been won, a new king was on the throne, a new emperor had arrived, a new son was born, and all the world needs to know and rejoice, the euangelion. And that word gets translated into Anglo-Saxon as gospel which has the same sort of meaning. It means the good story. So Mark says the beginning of the good news about Jesus the Messiah, the Son of God. What does he mean when he says gospel? Is he referring to the book we call Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the four gospels? Or is he meaning the story that he's about to tell about Jesus? Or is he meaning everything that's going to be done in Jesus? This is the beginning of it, and it carries on from here, and it goes on into all the world. I'm not quite sure which it is, but there is a level of excitement. Maybe all three. Can we come back and capture that excitement just now? It's really interesting that when both Paul and the four gospel writers look for a word to sum up the Christian faith, what God has done in Jesus, they go for the word euangelion. Good news. Now, yeah, it's about sin. Yes, it's about God being with us in suffering. Yes, it's about repentance. Yes, it's about transformation. Yes, it's about what's right. Yes, it's about the death of Jesus on the cross for us, paying for our sins that we might be forgiven by God. But all of that taken together is incredibly good news, and good news that we want to rejoice in and we want to share. You know, Christians ought to be the happiest people in the world. Now, I don't mean by that going around saying life's wonderful the whole time. I don't mean that at all. But I mean that we have at the center of our story something that the whole of the Bible says is good news. Good news for everyone. Do you believe that? 
Is it good news? Is it? I sometimes think we're not sure. Even if we think it's true, and it's necessary, and it's helpful, and it's the truth, and we should share it, we hesitate on whether it's good news. Sometimes it leaves us with a feeling of inadequacy and guilt because we haven't grasped it properly, but it is good news. I also think it's one of the problems that we have with our mission. We're not very sure it's good news. Maybe we're sitting with people and somebody says something about church or, or belief or whatever it is, and our heart just sinks. Because either I'm going to say nothing and feel really guilty afterwards that I missed the opportunity, or I'm going to say something I'm going to feel dreadful because it's going to be embarrassing and they're all going to laugh at me. And so we, we maybe say something about what we believe or what Christians think or that we go to church or whatever else it is, and then we're almost left afterwards saying, I'm, I'm really sorry for having said that. I might have upset you and I'm sorry. As if we've just given them bad news. But what if we had the idea like the shepherds did or the wise men did, that what we have is actually good news, and it's good news for all people, and it's good news for them, then suddenly we would share it in a different way. The beginning of the story that Mark goes on to tell, of course, is the story of John the Baptist. John the Baptist, all these people flocking out to him because he's got good news to share. John the Baptist coming, and he's different from the temple and the boring stuff that happens in Jerusalem. There's something about the life of God in him, and yet he's pointing to Jesus. And Jesus arrives on the scene, and he's baptized. And he's coming out of the water, and those words are spoken. You are my son whom I love. With you I am well pleased. Now, here's the interesting thing. Jesus is not a child anymore. He's about to start his ministry, and Mark's going to tell us it's going to be hard. The next thing that's going to happen is he's going to be out there being tempted, fighting with the devil in the wilderness, starving, suffering, and all those things. And Mark, the whole of the gospel of Mark leads to the cross and to everything that's going to happen to Jesus in rejection. Battles with Satan and the cross and suffering. But at the start of it, these words from the Father, you are my son whom I love, with you I'm well pleased. God saying to Jesus right at the start, you need to hear this. I am with you, and you're in me, and we are one. Those are the words at Jesus' baptism. It's interesting. I wonder how many of people in their lives today are, are screwed up because no parent said to them at the start, I love you. You matter. You're mine. And it's no accident that it's here at the baptism, because the other thing that's happening at the baptism is Jesus is doing something that identifies with us. Every believer hearing Mark's gospel at this point would have known that it was weird that Jesus was baptized, because baptism was to do with sin, and Jesus didn't sin. But they would also know that they had been baptized and what does that baptism say? God saying to each and every believer, you are my child whom I love. With you I am well pleased. And if nothing else, as you go away today, at the beginning of this year, hear those words to you, marked by your baptism. You are my child whom I love, and with you I'm well pleased. Because if we have the notion of a God who loves us and gives us good news and cares for us, then everything else begins to make some sense, and anything else that we begin to have to face or go through 
we do with that security that we are loved and we are cared for. And I think that we need to hear that today. There's something else, for it says here that Jesus saw the heaven being torn open and the Spirit descending like a dove. Now, it's interesting in Isaiah, when there's a prayer that's going on in desperate times, and Isaiah says, oh, that you would rend the heavens and come down. What Isaiah is saying at that point is this, this, this deep prayer from the heart, and we have all prayed that prayer, haven't we? God, do something. Do something. Break through the whole thing with your presence. And here is God saying at this baptism, I am rending the heavens and coming down. I'm sending my son. I'm tearing heaven and earth apart for you. You are loved. You are my child. And I delight in you. Yes, the gospel is about our human weakness. Yes, it is about the need to repent. Yes, it's an invitation like the disciples were given to come and to follow, to struggle, to share, to know a deeper commitment. But at the beginning, it is good news because God's power is entering into the world in love. And that is the basis of our walk with Him. Ancient documents from olden days of the Reformation aren't always the most inspiring things. But twice this week, people have shared with me words that come from 1563, the Heidelberg Catechism. 450, 460 years ago that Christians have been using throughout Europe for a long time. Now, the, the history of it doesn't matter, but let me share it with you. Here are the words. What is your only comfort in life and death? This is how it starts, a long theological treatise, that I am not my own, but belong body and soul in life and death to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. Will we say that together? Let me ask the question. What is your only comfort in life and death? That I am not my own, but belong body and soul in life and in death to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. And it goes on because it gets better and better. Let's say this together, read this together. He has fully paid for all my sins with His precious blood and has set me free from the tyranny of the devil. He also watches over me in such a way that not a hair can fall from my head without the will of my Father in heaven. In fact, all things must work together for my salvation because I belong to Him. Christ, by His Holy Spirit, assures me of eternal life and makes me wholeheartedly willing and ready from now on to live for Him. How are those words for a good new year? Just know those words from the Scripture. You are my child whom I love, and in you I am well pleased. I'm going to invite you as we sing our next song, Longing for Light, which speaks about our hope in, in the Lord to come and to light a candle. I've got plenty more if we run out. And as you do that, not as a pledge to what you're going to do in the new year or you're going to offer to God in the new year, but in this to know that His light shines on you. And there's one thing I'd ask you to do this year. is to find a place to allow Him to keep reminding you of that love. For it's that love that leads us in the discipleship that we need, in the commitment that we need, in the prayer that we need. Perhaps you want to read the Gospel of Mark, but not as a discipline or a commandment, but as a joy 
in the good news. So let's sing Christ be our light. And as we do that, I just invite you just to come as you're able around the tables and to light a candle looking for the Lord Jesus in your life, renewing you in this new year. I'm going to pray, uh, and then we're going to sing again. So if you haven't had the opportunity to come and to light the candle, you'll have an opportunity in, in the second hymn we're going to sing. Let's pray. Oh Lord, as we come into the new year, we are aware, even in the good things that we hope for, of the darkness, the darkness of war, the darkness of poverty, the darkness of conflict, physical, political, in families, in communities, in nations. We're aware of the people that are struggling, for they are far from home. We think of those who know grief, or the concerns of ill health. 
and yet we come looking for good news, for the light of Christ to be released into the world that says that you have rent the heavens and come down. And at the beginning of this new year, Lord, we have all aspirations for ourselves of what we might do or who we might be, but we also come with the realism of our frailty and our failures and our broken promises. But Christ has come. And as we meditate on that, we know we are loved. We know we are bought, we are redeemed, we are given a promise that cannot be taken from us no matter what we do, that we are His in life and in death. And so this morning we would simply come and bask in that, rejoice in that, know that. And ask that you would pour your grace into our hearts that might confirm by your Holy Spirit all that you have done and promised to us individually and as your people and as your church throughout the world. That we cannot be loved any more than we have been loved by you. And that your love will never let us go. For you have given your only Son that we might not perish, but have life that is the life of eternity, now and forever. And so, Lord, we ask (laughs) that you would let us overflow with the joy of this good news. And that you would strengthen it in us that we would never let it go this year ahead, no matter what happens. This we ask. This we know you have promised already. Amen. We sing of the good news. How lovely are the mountains on the, are the feet of him who brings good news. Let's sing this, and if you haven't lit the candle and you want to do that as we are, as we're singing, and if you're not able, nudge your neighbor and ask him to come and do it for you.
This is the point that I usually say the blessing to all of you, but to this, today I thought we would sing the blessing to each other and sing the Lord bless you and keep you. Can I encourage you? If you, know the, if you don't know the words, you'll be looking at the screen, but if you do know the words, look at each other as you sing this. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May you know God's blessing on your life, His presence, His promises to you this day. Let's pray that prayer for each other as we sing the blessing. Mm -hmm.